it's like um, a human being suffering a heart attack. You can have all the symptoms. You can be in the, you know, the clinical category of a person that is likely to suffer a heart attack, but not actually change your behaviour until you suffer the heart attack. The pace is, is accelerating much faster than any of us anticipated um, in terms of the climate change predictions. And, and that's coinciding with peak oil and much more knowledge about peak oil. And um, I, I think much sooner than we expected, we, we're going to come up, we're going, we're going to hit some real crunches. And that's when it gets interesting. When we reach those crunch points, those, those pivotal turning points, that's going to be where it's really interesting. That's when ethics will be tested, really. Do we resort to self-interest in those periods of crisis? every man for themselves, survival of the fittest type scenarios, you know, or do we realise that it is in all of our best interests to work cooperatively? Given that we have um, documents like the, the United Nations Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that, that looks at degradation of a whole range of ecosystems for a whole range of reasons, one of which is climate change. You know, when you look at those broad documents, you know, what, what you realise is that many of the things that we need to do to respond to climate change, we need to do for a whole range of interconnected reasons. We cannot uh, be spending all this time and money and energy just focusing on issues like climate change and not at the same time be addressing human poverty issues. Because if we don't address those issues of human poverty and need, uh, those problems will continue and they will always undermine anything that we try and achieve in environmental terms. They are so deeply connected. Poverty causes environmental degradation. Environmental degradation causes poverty. We are the first generation to really understand what's going on here. We are the first generation that are in a position to take on this responsibility, and we will. People talk a lot about the importance of individual action, and um, I didn't really understand the importance of individual action myself until quite recently. I think individual action is crucial in terms of, you know, walking the talk is one aspect, um, uh, exercising leadership, if you, if you do things as opposed to just talk about them, you create um, a model for other people or an example for other people to follow. You know, if you, if you live in um, an apartment or a flat with other people, you can influence what's happening in that apartment. You can influence, have a huge influence on what's happening in your family. You can have a huge influence on what's happening in your workplace just by your activity and by the discussion and debate you might start in your workplace. I think it's very important to um, put this into practice and have successes and have failures and then to analyse why you've failed. You might choose as an individual to reduce your ecological footprint by taking public transport only to find that when you start to do this, it's actually incredibly hard, it's expensive, it's inconvenient and so on. Well, you know, it's important to experience those problems so that you can participate in the public discussion that helps to overcome those barriers. So you're doing it from a position of knowing. If we see this in terms of a collective responsibility, then it's not just, this is my individual choice, I can do it or not because it only affects me. If we have understand um, these issues in a context of broader responsibility, then it's not about individual choice. It's about the consequences of response, and it's about consequences, and it's about taking responsibility for those consequences. I think the value of you know an ethical understanding is that it gives us that frame that that deeper framework to understand how we got ourselves in this position. When you analyse a lot of the responses 
that we've come up with so far, you know, legal responses and policy responses, when you analyze them, you realize that they're never going deep enough, they're never going far enough, they're just skating across the surface. And what they're doing is that they're really, they're not examining the deeper questions that need to be examined, and in doing so, they're, they're only kind of dealing with the symptoms and never addressing the, the deep causes of this, um, this fact that, that human activity is, is dramatically overstepping the ecological capacities of the earth. I have my concern that uh, if we don't understand climate change in those terms as a symptom, uh, we'll be so busy dealing with climate change that we won't see the Tyrannosaurus Rex coming up behind us in the form of a whole lot of other symptoms. Many of the things that, that we might be suddenly thinking of as a response to climate change, like um, energy efficiency, public transport, you know, these kind of very, very specific responses, we need to be doing those things anyway. We need to make these sorts of changes for a whole variety of reasons. And um, what, 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 reason do we have to delay? I don't know.